Hi everyone and welcome to mod 50 and 52. We're talking about parents, peers, and adulthood. Here are your learning objectives and here's your vocab. Remember within here there are eight different pieces of vocab essentially. So how do early experiences modify a brain? So our genes are like the the road map, right? They're like the, the thing that we're given but our environment plays such an important role on all of those details and how and what gets played out. Um, there was a study on rats raised in an enriched environment and others raised in solitary confinement. And what they found was a thicker brain cortex on those raised in the enriched environment. So the environment truly plays an important role and we can see from certain case studies where children have been um, severely neglected that this is also true. Babies are born with excess neural connections, which is great because it helps them learn and make all sorts of new connections. They're constantly learning. Babies are better learners than any other age group. They're constantly learning so much information in language and grammar, and there's just so many components to language alone, but they're learning about the whole world, and they're doing little science experiments with their toys in terms of what happens when I do this. Like, there's just so much going on, and so that um, having all those neural connections when you're really little baby, toddler, is so important. Now, how do parents play a role here? Society tends to praise parents for whatever society finds as like a virtue and then blames them for their vices. But in reality, um, the parent isn't really controlling a lot of that. When we look at shared environmental influences from the womb onward, they typically account for less than 10% of children's differences, meaning that parents have much less influence on those personality on those personality traits that someone might say, oh, well, who's raising that kid where he acts like that? Like those personality traits really are something that the parent can have one child who has one type of personality and another child who has another. If you have a sibling, you might know what I'm talking about. So bottom line, parents can relax a little bit and know that like you can't control um, the person that your child is. You can do a lot to help them, right, and create these enriching environments, but you can't change the personality. Where we do see the clearest um, difference is if the child is abused or neglected, then obviously there's going to be um, a more impactful um, situation that the parents had and it's not a good one. What about peers? So as adolescents begin to want to form their own identity separate from their parents, they pull away from parents and start looking at peers. If a preschooler doesn't like a certain food, won't eat it at home, they might eat it at school if all of their friends are eating it. Children who hear English with one accent at home and another in the neighborhood or at school, they will adopt the accent of their peers, not their parents. And I'm sure you might notice that with people who maybe your parents are first generation and maybe they they speak English in, in an, with an accent and maybe you don't. Um, and maybe the slang you use, right, <clears throat> compared to your parents, reflects a different culture. And that can be seen no matter you know, what generation of parents and what generation of children. Teens who smoke typically have peers who model smoking. And again, some of that might be, there's a correlation there. It might not be the cause. It might just be that those more risk-taking um, peers find each other. Howard Gardner said that parent and peer influences are actually very complementary. That parents have some influence or more influence in certain areas like education, discipline, responsibility, um, charitableness, and the way that you interact with a peer. I'm sorry, an authority. Peers are much more interesting to adolescents and they're, they do have influence, but it's not on those certain staples. When it's like 
what should I do with my life? Like those big life decisions. So Eric Erickson, he created a theory of social development. So this is the psychosocial stages. There are eight of them. Each one of these is important. Bold it, underline it, highlight it as the vocab. So for each stage, he said that there is a social conflict and you either get out of it successfully or unsuccessfully. And if unsuccessfully, it kind of carries with you. So here is the names of the stages. You can pause this and the age groups. You don't have to remember this um, virtue developed thing. So just don't worry about that. So we're gonna go through each stage. So stage one, the conflict is trust versus mistrust. So this is a newborn or to a one and a half year old baby. And they are totally dependent on their guardians. Are my needs being met? If I am cold, if I am hungry, if I want to be held, if, I, um, need, if I'm tired, are my needs being met? And if they are being met, if the parent or guardian is responsive to those needs, then the child will have success and feel like the world is a trusting place. In stage two, this is age one and a half to three, the conflict is autonomy versus shame and doubt. So the question that they have is, can I do things for myself? Can I pick out my own shirt? Can I like or not like certain things or ask for those things even? Can I play with certain toys and not the other? Um, learning how to control their um, going to the bathroom. Do I have this autonomy to do things for myself? Put on my shoes. If the parent and if the child is given these opportunities at home, at preschool, to try to do things on their own. And if they make mistakes, if they're constantly met with like scolding, um, at, like they try to pour something and they spill it and the parent freaks out every time, they're going to walk away from the stage with shame and doubt about their abilities. If the stage is successful, they will develop a sense of independence. I can do things for myself, which leads into the next stage. They all lead into each other. Stage three is initiative versus guilt. So does the child take initiative into doing things? Can I lead others? So think in a play group saying, hey, let's all play tag. That would be taking initiative. Um, can they be curious and creative and come up with the new game or ask their parents to say, hey, can we do this thing on Saturday? And it's not just like agreeing to go or having a preference, but it's about them taking lead and taking initiative. So if they are successful, they will continue to take risks in life, safe risks, right? Those are important, good risks, and they will develop self-confidence. So it leads in from autonomy. So all of that self-confidence and leadership and self-esteem is going to go into stage four, industry versus inferiority. So now they are in school, elementary school. And the question is, am I capable of doing things well? So put them in a school, right? And the teacher is giving them math or reading or there's also sports, right? Organized sports. Uh, am I good at something? Don't have to be good at everything, but am I competent at some things? If the child is successful in this stage, they will learn that they are competent and good at certain things. Again, it doesn't have to be everything, but they will feel this sense of industry, that they're they are good at certain things. They're competent. Next, you have identity versus role confusion. Okay, I have my self-esteem. I'm ready to take risks. I know that I'm good at some things. Now the question is, who am I? And this is the task of age 12 to 20. And this process of developing a sense of self, they might try out certain hats, join different friend groups, different social groups, um, try out different activities, different hobbies and interests to figure out like, who am I? What, how, how would I answer that question? If this is unresolved, they might feel pressured to kind of go into a certain identity that doesn't fit them. Um, or 
just constantly try on different hats and kind of go with what they think others want them to go with. But if successful, they walk away with that answer, who, who am I? Now, in the 20s, they enter emerging adulthood. And this is for some people in modern culture. So it's not universal. It's not in all cultures. But it's a period from late teens to mid 20s where you are in some ways like physically an adult and um, you might have even graduated college, but you are not a fully independent living on your own um, adult, responsible adult. You still rely on your parents. And this is actually a growing, <laughs> emerging adulthood in the United States used to be shorter and now it's growing um, in terms of how long um, people are living at home, etc. So the next stage, so again, could still be in that emerging adulthood, is longer now, 20s to 40s. And this is intimacy versus isolation. Sorry, that should say 20 to 40. And the question is, can I share who I am, which I just figured out in stage five, with another person? And it's about sharing and disclosing intimate aspects of who you are, how you're feeling, how you're doing, um, and having those dig deep kind of conversations. If unsuccessful, the person feels socially isolated and avoids close emotional relationships. So the person could be very social and still be isolated because it's about disclosing yourself and who you truly are to other people in your life. Next is generativity versus stagnation. And this is 40s to 60s. And the question is, can I contribute to society in a meaningful way. So this is, okay, I've figured out who I am. I have these intimate relationships. What can I give back to um, my children, the children of the world, the planet, to my career fields? Um, it's about going above and beyond yourself and helping others. The next is the last, and it's integrity versus despair. So this is late 60s and onward, and the question is, can I reflect on my life with satisfaction? So if the person is in old age and they really just have a lot of regrets about something and they're really hung up on it, because people always have some regrets, but overall they feel satisfied, right? That would be integrity. If the person does not overall feel satisfied, then they're in despair about things that... Um, they question about their life. So some notes on your stage that you're likely in right now is identity versus role confusion, 12 to 20. So there are different characteristics of the identity stage, such as experimenting, trying on those different hats. It's also rebellion, pushing away from your parents and being your own true self. And with that all comes a bit of selfishness. And a lot of times, Identity versus role confusion stage gets a bad rap for being so selfish, but a lot of it is you figuring out who you are and where you fit. And so it's important to be a little selfish in that time period, right? It's not the generativity versus stagnation period where you've got that all figured out. This is your time to figure out you. Um, and it's generally also a time of optimism because there's so much ahead and what am I going to do and who am I going to do that with? And, and this means that parents and children are going to fight in this stage. That is a common thing. Um, but generally speaking, parents and children do get along overall. More than half of all middle class teens in a worldwide survey rated family relationships as most important in the guiding their principles. So like I said, big life things, they go to their parents. So takeaways, Erickson stages, know them. Focus on the challenge, the conflict for each age group. If it's unresolved, they remember they continue onward and it's going to negatively impact them. If you didn't have trust versus mistrust, that carries on until it's successfully fulfilled, which could still happen in childhood or teen years. Each stage builds upon the previous. Parents play an important role in the social development of one's early years, but they're not going to change a child's personality. 
parents and peers are both influential in different aspects of life and at different times. So that sums up module 50 and 52, and I will see you in class.